Revelation 14. 1, 4. Let us go to verse 12, and we'll read to the end of the chapter. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud... One sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle, and another angel uh, came out from the altar which had power over fire and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in the sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress even unto the horses' bridles by the space of a thousand and 600 furlongs. Well, here this evening we begin a text that takes us to a new place in God's judgment. Up until now, God's hand of judgment, that is God the Son, uh, has not been personally a part of the reaping of the nations the wicked nations of the world. Last week we saw the distinction between the 144,000 who had the mark of God on their forehead and between those individuals who took the mark of the beast in their hand or their forehead. And uh, it's important for us as believers to realize that we don't have to be afraid of the technology. We have to be afraid of aligning with the wrong technology or the wrong person. I know, I remember growing up and, uh, you know, hearing the discussions uh, the Bible prophecy guys back then he was still is Jack Van Impey still plugging the earth with his teaching and so forth it's probably not a nice way to say it is it is he still around or is he gone I think he's still alive he's still alive still on the Trump comedy channel doing the things the prophecy or whatever <coughs> TBN it's TBN right um, is he I think he got kicked off of there did he really oh <laughs> Well, I just don't know much about it, but when I was a kid, Jack Van Impey was talking about Revelation, and as far as I know, he still is, as, as much as I know, I just don't watch those guys on television and so forth. But I remember so much they used to talk about the mark of the beast, and they would uh, have barcodes and uh, credit cards, you know, the, <laughs> the graphics of a barcode or of a, of a credit card flashing, and, and be talking about, you know, the technology and how this is going to usher in the end times or the last days. Uh, some time ago I realized that it isn't technology or technological advances, it isn't even the things that we have developed in the last 100 years that is going to make the coming of the Lord Jesus or the judgment of the world any nearer. The fact is, is that we're all aware of how quickly technology changes, aren't we? Uh, I mean, right now Charlie's texting on his smartphone, and you couldn't have done that like even 10 years ago as he's... Are you texting, Charlie? You're not texting. Are no, I was just looking up to see if he's still alive. Oh, you're checking on Jack Van. He's Googling on his smartphone. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> Taj is so happy because he's got his down here where I can't see it. And he looks down. He's like, he's like yeah, you got Charlie for once. <laughs> so, anyway. <laughs> uh, but it's really funny because, like, this is, believe it or not, a somewhat cheap quality uh, smartphone. And uh, the fact of the matter is, is that this this would have been the kind of things that they would have made sci-fi movies about 
back in the 1980s and so forth, and actually probably is pretty nearly, except for its ability to teleport me places, <laughs> is uh, pretty nearly uh, exceeds all the ideas that we had. Remember when they used to, you know, have the little wrist phones where you could, you know, they were video phones, you could actually see the person and so forth? Well, I mean, that's like yesterday technology. Now, you know, we have all kinds of different video conferencing applications and so forth. And uh, so, but my point is this, that, you know, back, well, when did, the, when did the first car phones come out? We need Al here so we can ask this question. Uh, when did the, like, what, the 1970s or 1960s that they had the first car phones? They look like a house phone, a big old house phone. I remember seeing a 1970s Porsche in the, in the auto auction when I was with my dad, like, wow, it's got a phone in it, you know, and it had a phone, I think it was rotary. I'm, pretty, I'm not sure about that. It was either you pressed buttons like this or it was a, I think it was a rotary. But a big old car phone looked like a house phone, you know, the, like the old house phones and so forth. Uh, technology can advance literally just in days or ages. So, you know, we can have events that happen on the earth that are so catastrophic that we can have happen what seems to have happened at the time of, um, of the flood where man, and, and even at the time of Babel, where God just confounds the knowledge, and uh, people go backward in knowledge. I'm not convinced that all of the technology that we've discovered in the last several hundred years is being discovered for the first time. A lot of times, just going backward uh, in, in uh, thinking and spiritually takes people backward technologically. For instance, think about this. Think what would happen if the tree huggers uh, had their way technologically in the world. <coughs> Think what would happen to energy. How much electricity would be allowed if the tree huggers took their philosophy all the way? How much plastic is acceptable? Glass, um, uh, oil, anything that's petroleum based, um, batteries. I mean, if the tree huggers had their way, we would be living in caves. <laughs> you know, and seriously. Uh, they're literally trying to take us backward from all the developments of the last 200 years. And again, that, that's, that's theoretical. That's my opinion. You could disagree with it, and I wouldn't, it wouldn't make me wrong or you right or whatever. But my point is that God can advance a society in a very short amount of time where people can, can develop technology. And so we don't have to have existing technology for Jesus to come back. In other words, for the last 2,000 years, Jesus wasn't like, well, you know, they got to invent the barcode. You know, I mean, the imminent return of Christ, the, the, the apostles only thought they lived in the last days, but they actually didn't because, you know, we just didn't have the technological advances that are needed by the Antichrist. You see what I'm saying? And so, uh, the same is true with Israel. This, that, what is true technologically is also true with Israel. I'm going to just tell you something. Uh, National Israel could disappear tomorrow. And God's people, who are Jews according to the flesh, would still exist. So you could take the land away from Israel, do what you like with it, and God could raise up a nation in a day. He doesn't need uh, what is being developed there. He doesn't need the embassy to be moved from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Uh, God can handle all these things. These things can happen very, very rapidly and in God's time. If these things were necessary, they do undermine the doctrine of the imminent return of Jesus Christ. If these things have to all be in place before Christ can return, then you can just date the return of Christ by the advancements or the things that you know, we see in the Revelation. And friend, that just isn't so. Uh, when Jesus was asked the, of the end times and the judgment the, uh, of the world by his disciples, what shall, when shall these things be, and what shall be the signs of thy coming and of the end of the world? Uh, his answer was, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, he said, be not troubled, for the end is not yet. In other words, we always think that wars and rumors of wars uh, are, these, are signs of the coming of God. I remember uh, the first Gulf War, and I remember how people thought, you know what, this is it. Jesus is going to return. I mean, this is the, that big war in the Middle East. And it looks like, you know, Iraq and Iran and Russia are lining up in different places. And, you know, we had all that discussion. And the second Gulf War, the same thing. 
uh, we heard the same thing and people believe it today now it's ISIS you know with what ISIS is doing you know it's real likely that Christians and Muslim or Christians and Jews are going to get together and then they're going to make peace with the Muslims and all these things and friend I'll just be honest with you they don't mean anything at all according to what Jesus said Jesus said when you hear of wars and rumors and wars of wars be not troubled for the end is not yet Jesus conclusion with his disciples though is what shall be the sign of thy coming uh, he said of that day at that time he said no man knoweth he said not the son of man the son of man doesn't know uh, he said neither the angels in heaven so if Jesus doesn't know when God is going to send him I promise you Jack Van Impe doesn't know and Harold Camping doesn't know and you can just talk about any person that you like that thinks that they know when the Lord Jesus is going to return including you if you think you do and I'll just tell you you don't know something that Jesus does not know. And so, uh, as a believer, it would be good for us, if that is not the application of Scripture, to set that aside and to apply the Scripture in a practical way. In other words, that's how the prophecy is oftentimes applied, isn't it? Most of the time when believers or lost people want to talk about Bible prophecy, they want to predict times, don't they? So we think about when we think of Bible prophecy, we think about predicting times. And that actually isn't the purpose of Bible prophecy. The pur purpose of Bible prophecy is to know what God wants and what God is doing. And so what is God doing today? You tell me. What is God doing today? What is happening in the world based on what God is doing? You've got to know this because you're Christian and people will ask you, you sit down on an airplane with somebody who's a non-believer, and they're very likely to ask you, what do you make of the events of the world today? A lot of people ask me that when they find out I'm a pastor. What do you make of all... I get a little tired of that question, but what do you make of the things that are going on? What's the answer? What? He's trying to redeem people himself. Yeah. The Holy Spirit is, is stopping things from being as bad as they could be. And more than anything else, we live in the age of the Holy Spirit, the church age, when the Holy Spirit is convicting men of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. You think that will segue right into giving someone the gospel? What's God doing? I'll tell you what God's doing. God is saving as many people as can be spared from the damnation and the destruction that we're about to see in Revelation 14. That's what God's doing. Christian, it would be good for us this week to have a conscious awareness of hell and not only of hell, but of God's hand of judgment. Yeah, you, if you know Jesus as your Savior, you know the love of God. You've experienced the love of God. Perhaps you haven't mined the depths of it. I always say as much as God loves you and as much as you realize that God loves you, the only thing that you can really know about that is that God loves you a lot more than you can know. The more I realize God loves me, the more I realize that God loves me way more than I can comprehend. Having recognized that, you and I have to realize that the day is going to come when as John saw one like the Son of Man. By the way, let's deal with that, like the Son of Man. In the Scripture, the Bible speaks very, very literally. When it says this is this, it means it's exactly that. When it says it's like something, then it means it's like that. Why would John uh, use the term like the Son of Man, speaking of the one sitting on a cloud in our, in our text this evening? Why would he use that vernacular? Was it an angel? I think it was some, an angel that looked like Jesus? Why would he use the vernacular, one like the Son of Man? Did John know what Jesus looked like? That's the first question, okay? If yes. We didn't get there. yes. How did he know what Jesus looked like? Yeah, I mean, he was with him for three and a half years of his ministry, and he was the disciple whom Jesus loved. He knew what Jesus looked like. So when John said, like the Son of Man, was it like, you know, hey, there's a, you know, there's a, Jesus look alike sitting on the cloud. I don't mean to be irreverent in saying that this evening. Is that what he meant? So why would he use the term like the Son of Man? Why would he say Jesus was sitting on a cloud? Because it wasn't Jesus. Because maybe it wasn't Jesus at all. Who was it? He was in his glorified body. Well, you guys are getting nutty here. Getting pretty far out there. Well, it could have been a dead Christian because in the book of Revelation... That looked like Jesus? That God sends, sends with a sickle to put his sickle into the ground and mm -hmm. reap the nations? Uh, God's going to use a person or an angel to uh, 
to cause the blood of the wicked to flow up to the, the horse's bridles for 1,600 furlongs? Now that's Jesus, isn't it? Isn't it, Charlie? Charlie, come on, don't, don't get into some whack religion here. You're going to go off and start a cult if you believe that. Common Core. Common Core prophecy. <laughs> You're not recording this, are you? <laughs> okay, the reason I believe, looking at the language, I'll just give you the answer. See, you're thinking now. At least everybody's like, well, I don't know. Uh, the reason he would say, like the Son of Man, is he never saw Jesus in the clouds. In other words, when he spent time with Jesus, how tall do you reckon Jesus probably was? Could we say less than seven feet tall? Right? I would probably guess he would have been probably less than six feet tall. You know? I don't know how big Jesus was, but he was human sized. So when Jesus is sitting on a cloud, if I were sitting on if I were sitting on a cloud, just think about this, okay? If I were sitting on a cloud, um, how big do you think I would need to be in order for you to see me? How big's a cloud? You ever get in a little airplane, fly through clouds just for fun, just kind of just try it sometimes, it's fun. Uh, you know, fly into clouds. You know, you can kind of see a cloud over there and go toward it, and you realize, well, it takes a couple of minutes just to get to the cloud. And if you're flying at, you know, 120 mile an hour, and it takes you a couple of minutes to get there, you realize, well, that thing is a couple of miles away. So if you could see it, and it looked like it was right there when you're flying toward it, probably it's a pretty large cloud, like miles big. Here's Jesus sitting on a cloud. All right? So he's very, very much, I mean, the features, the person, it's Jesus. But he says, like the Son of Man, because he never saw Jesus like that. I want to remind us about something here, Christian. There's a point to this. I'm not just uh, rambling for fun. I want to remind us that God, as manifested to us on earth, was very meek and very lowly. Jesus became, the Bible said, in the likeness of men, and He was the servant of men. You know, I, we sang the song at Christmas, How Should a King Come? We talk about what's rightful for a king. The fact of the matter is that a king is a serious demotion. Being a king would be a serious demotion from being God. God's the king of kings, if you will, but he's more than that. He's the ruler of the world. And so when Jesus is sitting on a cloud, he is in his glory as God. And so what John saw as the Son of Man, you see the phrase, the Son of Man, which likens him to a man, he's evidently not just a man here. Does that make sense? And so here is a... Uh, snapshot or an aspect of Jesus that is different than what John is accustomed to. He's different because he is, of course, in his, as somebody said, in his glorified body. He's different because he is very, very larger than life. Very much larger than life, but he's Jesus. And he is about to be different. You don't see Jesus in his earthly ministry thrusting in a sickle and blood flowing up to the horse's bridles. For a 1,600 furlongs is 200 miles. 200 miles. So if you and I were to go to the coast of Florida and we were to go directly to the other side, it's 80-something, I think, miles, maybe 90 miles uh, across. Yeah, it's a little more than that, less than 100 miles, I think, from coast to coast. So it would be like two coasts of Florida. It would be how far the blood would flow up to the horse's bridle, so about this high, and I believe it would be 200 linear miles that the blood would have flown. This is a very, very much larger than life situation, isn't it? Okay, so here we find in verse 14, I look, John said, behold, a white cloud upon the cloud, one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And verse 15 says, and another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap. This is interesting. For the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And messenger or an angel comes and tells Jesus, the time to reap is now. Now, that's an interesting study actually to ask the question of if Jesus is there and he's got his sickle in his hand, why does he have to be told by an angel when to reap? It's an interesting question, isn't it? Again, it shows submission to the will of the Father. 
It shows that uh, Jesus is willing, it, or it demonstrates as well, the long-suffering character and nature of God. And friend, here now we have turned the page, we have turned the corner to the place and the time where God's mercy is no longer withheld. Where God is no longer uh, holding back the judgment of the world. The angel said, okay, it's over, it's done. And we have seen this picture of these 144,000 who are singing the song of Moses and a song that only the 144,000 could sing. And so it must have been either deep bass or high tenor or something. I don't know, maybe it was out of everybody else's room. Okay, that's yeah, probably a little bit of a dead joke there. But they were, they were taught a song that only they could sing. And uh, they are brought to a place where uh, they are going to be protected and spared. But those of them that are killed now are going to have an eternal reward. Now, we need to look at this because it's important to notice uh, this eternal, uh, or the eternal reward. Look at verse 13 as well. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. I don't want to spend a lot of time, I don't want to belabor this, but there are good people who believe that no one can get saved after the rapture. And if that were so, this 144,000 would not be here. And so this is yet another uh, just simple passage of the Scripture that helps us to understand the opportunity. Not only to receive the Gospel, but the opportunity as well to have eternal rewards. Did you notice this? The Bible says that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. And so literally the things that they do still matter. Isn't God good? Isn't God gracious? I, for one, do not want to be present at this time, but I'm thankful that those that are have many of the same opportunities that we have today to work for the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, moving forward then, uh, in verse 16, the Bible says, He that sat on the cloud thrust his sickle in the earth, and the earth was reaped. And the Bible says in verse 17, so you just see this, in my mind I see this, this picture where the earth itself, and I don't know how you reap the earth, but the earth is just gleaned or reaped. And I don't know whether it would be just a sickle being thrust through the earth, but I just see the globe of the earth, one in the cloud reaching down and just reaping the whole thing all at once. Verse 17, Another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over the fire, over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. My friend, God's judgment is so thorough that He will judge even the earth. And we see here that the Bible says, The angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And here we find God's long suffering come to a conclusion. The conclusion that, or what happens when that happens in verse 20. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress even unto the horse bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. And again, this is just before the seven last plagues. The, everything is not finished. Everything is not done, but God's mercy and God's wrath has been directed toward the last who will receive it, those 144,000. And now God is going to mete out judgment to the wicked. And as I look at this passage of Scripture, and as I try in my mind as much as I'm able to wrap my, my, my mind around the concept of... 200 miles of blood up to the horse's bridles. I just think of the devastating effects of this judgment. And I'll be honest with you, there's nothing in my mind that I can compare it to. I don't know if you've ever taken a tour of a slaughterhouse, but they're, they're, they make a pretty vivid picture. You'd like me to detail a slaughterhouse to anyone here? If you go to a really big slaughterhouse, no, I should, my wife's doing, no, oh, don't tell us about the slaughterhouse. Um, it's gross. You have, uh, used to be a little more, um, a little less technologically advanced, but it's still, it's not terribly advanced over what it was. But a big slaughterhouse has animals just 
moving in constantly. So you'll have a cattle and a chute just heading in, all in a line, hundreds and hundreds of them. And you'll have the donker, you know, the person that donks the cattle on the head. And so they have to make, it's, now they have like a thing, you know, it's, it's either air or electronic, put on the cow's head, and it kills them instantly. And they go down, they, somebody puts a hook in them, and then they go in, they skin them, and they bleed them out. And literally, when you go through the slaughterhouse, when you come into certain places, and there's literally just blood just flowing out of the place. And they recycle that and use it for a lot of things that you guys eat uh, on, a, on a regular basis. But uh, the fact is, is that it's a pretty disgusting thing. And the, the really disgusting aspect of it is not so much the sight, it's the smell. And it's the, that warm smell of slaughter. And I cannot, for one, imagine the devastation of this. I've seen, I've seen um, devastation from storms. I got to work in Hurricane Katrina. I've been in some pretty major hurricanes. And one of the things that's always struck me about hurricanes is that I can only get a picture of, of, a, of an, one thing, one scene. I can't get the scope of the devastation. I think when you drive for 180 miles and everything is destroyed, it's like the whole time, I remember the first time driving through, I've driven through like 30 miles of devastation and just thinking, oh wow, oh wow, oh wow, oh wow. For 30 miles, it's like, oh whoa. Oh my, wow. Oh wow. 180 miles. Can you imagine driving 180 miles and just seeing just devastation? That's the way Hurricane Katrina was. Plus 20 miles, you could be in blood. Up to the horse's bridle. So you literally could get in a boat and travel on blood for 200 miles. Jesus is coming. And God's desire is mercy. And God's love is very compelling. It ought to be. Listen, if you need to be loved, you need Jesus. Everybody needs to be loved, don't they? If you don't know what love is, if you haven't experienced love, you need to know Jesus. My friend, if you won't respond to God's love, you'll be part of His judgment. And as devastating as this scene is, and as terrifying, and perhaps some of you may even think inappropriate as it may seem, it pales in comparison with hell and the lake of fire <coughs> and eternal torment. And as I ponder these things, I believe that it should take our thoughts back to the opportunity of the day in which we live in which God's desire is mercy. Matter of fact, Jesus said, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Jesus already died. And as I see these bloody events and bloody scenes, I think of the blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary. So that you and I could be partakers of God's mercy. And I think of the last words of the Savior as He gave His disciples instructions. In every account of the last words of Jesus, they were instructed to go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And so I'm reminded that Revelation was not written so that we could guess when God's going to come. It's not written so that you know, people that are in the tribulation can have a road map on what's next. Though it may be useful for that. It's written so you and I can be aware of the future of the wicked and so that we will see the importance and necessity of carrying out the Great Commission and warning the lost. You know, that is one of the great blessings of Revelation, when you know what is going to happen in the end, you realize that God wins. So does every believer. But you also realize that the wicked lose. And we ought to be, just as God is, driven to compassion for the wicked, for the lost. 
Sometimes when I hear of wickedness, I'm shocked, I'm outraged, I'm even angry at the wicked. God has enough judgment that I don't need any. I really ought to be afraid for the wicked. And so preach the gospel. Friend, this week we ought to preach the gospel. We ought to be concerning ourselves with whether or not we're wasting our time preaching the gospel. We ought to just preach the gospel. Sometimes you ever preach to somebody and it seems as though, well, you know what, this person's not even interested. Well, my friend, they're still going to be judged. So just preach the gospel. Sometimes they don't receive it well and they want to cause you problems and, you know, they're going to be destroyed. So just preach the gospel. Um, it's a liberating thing to realize that we, we ought to obey God rather than men in this matter. And it ought to be ever present in the forefront of our minds that if those whom we cross paths with die without Jesus, or if we are taken and they remain, their end is terrible. And so we ought to just preach the gospel. Father, I pray that you would help us to retain these images that are in the Revelation. And I ask that you would help us in our minds to not only comprehend them, but to be willing to allow them to make enough impression on us that we have compassion for the lost, just as Jesus does and just as you do. And I pray that as a result that we would get outside of ourselves and the curiosity of events would be less important to us than the imminence of judgment. We ask you help us now with these things in Jesus' name.